August 2019 will mark 400 years since the first documented slave trade took place on American soil. Back then, obviously, still the English colony. Afro-Americans and America. Not aiming to be pompous, it's hard to imagine more unusual bond. USA is the homeland to the people that for generations and for centuries were denied their humanity. The homeland to those whose enslavement was the driving force of the state economy and helped build up USA dominant position in the New World and later on effectively in the world. A homeland to people that for years after abolitioning of slavery were denied the same rights. James Baldwin in The Fire Next Time recalls a very interesting argument uh, when he refers to 1954 ruling of Supreme Court Brown v. Board of Education of Topeka, in which Supreme Court declared state laws establishing separate public schools for black and white students to be unconstitutional. In his comment, Baldwin um, states that ruling of Supreme Court had more to do with outside political situation rather than inside awakening of moral norms. And the political situation being the Cold War and US and Russia competition in trying to appeal to awakening African nations. Then, after ending legalized segregation, majority of Afro-Americans were pushed farther into ghettos and were and still are five times more often incarcerated than white Americans. According to most recent census, USA is 63% 0.7% non-Hispanic white, 12.2% black, 8.7% Hispanic, and that 12.2% Afro-Americans in the society makes up over 40% of prison population. United States holds 25% of world's prison population in total, but only 5% of world's people. The disproportion is huge, right? USA has a half million more prisoners than China, which has a population five times greater than the United States. And it's pointless to mention, obviously, that it's China that is being schooled on human rights by USA, not the other way around. The most scary it gets when one looks at prison industry in USA, and it's really hard not to think of it as a new form of slavery. Let me read you a glimpse of an article. Human rights organizations, as well as political and social ones, are condemning what they are calling a new form of inhumane exploitation in the United States, where they say a prison population of up to 2 million, mostly black and Hispanic, are working for various industries for a pittance. For the tycoons who have invested in the prison industry, it has been like finding a pot of gold. They don't have to worry about strikes or paying unemployment insurance, vacations or comp time. All of their workers are full-time and never arrive late or are absent because of family problems. Moreover, if they don't like the pay of 25 cents an hour and refuse to work, they are locked up in isolation cells. Yeah. I will link all the articles and data I refer to in this video down in the box below. There will be quite a few links that you can read if you are interested in finding out more. It's a very terrifying picture that I just painted and probably there will be some contra arguments down in the comment section below that I would love to discuss, obviously. And you also will probably think why you, living on the other side of the world, rise it up. Maybe it's easier for me to talk about it being separated from the problem, but I'm extremely puzzled, being honest, and worried reading about US prison system, <coughs> about teenagers being shot by the police or white neighbors because of wearing a hoodie or listening loudly to music and being bold enough to talk back, uh, which obviously is something that white teenagers never do, wearing a hoodie or talking back, right? I'm talking about Trayvon Martin or Jordan Davis. 
but there were many others. But let me mention only 12 years old tiny rice. And really, if you live in a country where you are seriously afraid of a 12 year old kid thinking the toy he has might be a gun, there's something extremely wrong with your current state of affairs. One on racial basis, as I think that this policeman would never, never made such an assumption if it was a white kid. And second, on access to the gun basis, I cannot even fathom the situation where me seeing a kid with something looking like a gun, I would think that it might be a real gun. Probably seeing an adult person with a gun, I would still think it's a toy gun. But I live on the other side of the world, in totally different reality. But all those informations leave me puzzled. All those information coming my way and then seeing people being surprised with Black Lives Matter movement or hearing from my American white work colleague uh, a total lack of understanding of NFL players kneeling for the anthem and what's more seeing his irritation as he reads it as disrespectful for the country and then when I try to paint the picture of what's the reason behind it I'm finding out that more people, more black people die killed by other black people. I mean, seriously. Everybody that doesn't understand a simple social dynamics of close communities where murdered body is not treated with the same respect by the state as the one outside of those communities where murderers are hardly ever caught because there is hardly any effort from the state side, where the justice system uh, within those communities is left in the hands of gangs. Everybody that doesn't understand that should read, for instance, A Ghetto Side by G. Lovey. Baldwin, then essayists in the collection put together by Word and probably the most audibly quotes in his Between the World and Me, Talk about the life in a body that defines your safety level in the society that you live in. <coughs> defines how you'll be seen by the legal system, how you should behave on the street and what you should wear not to risk losing your life. There are a few moments in word collection where parents question if they should even bring their kids to the world if that is a responsible behavior, knowing that you are not able to protect them, to assure their safety when they walk the streets. And that is heart-wrenching. And you know what is the most sad? That if I had to judge those three essays collection on the optimism level, I mean, if we can even use such a category, I would probably have to say that the Fire Next Time, a collection from 1963, is the most optimistic, encouraging the work that needs to be done to avoid the fire next time. The most shocking essay in the fire this time is probably the one by Edwidge Danticat, where there is a quotation from the Raha Georgiani, an immigration attorney and law professor. Hear me out. Suppose a client walked into my office and told me that police officers in his country had choked a man to death over a petty crime. Suppose he said police fatally shoot another man in the back as he ran away. That they arrested a woman during a traffic stop and placed her in jail where she dies three days later that a 12-year-old boy in his country was shot and killed by the police as he played in the park. Suppose he told me that all of those victims were from the same ethnic community, a community whose members fear being harmed, tortured or killed by the police or prison guards, and that this is true in cities and towns across the nation. At that point, as an immigration lawyer, I tell him he had a strong claim for asylum protection under US law. Yeah, please think about it and leave your comments down in the box below. I would love to hear them. Okay, guys, that's it.